Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. I am joined by a very special guest on the Sports Fanatic News Baseball cast. As my very special guest is someone I used to do the Great West podcast with when we were over at OT Heroics, which is Alex Clark. And we're going to talk about some of the overall teams in the league. We're going to talk about our two teams, the Mariners and Phillies, and some comparable to the statistics of those teams early, as well as some surprise teams in the league early, a la maybe the Minnesota Twins. Uh, so we'll jump into it all for you. But first and foremost, Alex, how are you doing? No, I'm doing good. It's going to be back talking with you again. Again, a storied history between you and I doing podcasts. It's always good to jump back on the mic with an esteemed, with an esteemed friend. So, but no, yeah, baseball season has been really weird this first month. And I will say I'm all about it just because there have been so many amazing storylines. And I'm just really glad it's not like the storylines we had back in 2011. I'm sorry, in 2021, where I remember this time last year, there were like six no hitters. And everyone was talking about the baseballs just being completely dead. And it was a sad time to, you know, to be a kind of a fan because it just seemed like there was no offense happening now. And now we're seeing at least a little bit of a surge, even though batting average is at an all-time low right now. But, no, the first month of the season is now in the books, thankfully. And there have been some really good stories, especially for both of our teams. Yeah, there's been some good, there's been the bad, there's been, for both of our teams, it's been a mix. Uh, your team, I would say, has had a little bit more um, overall consistency from a starter where we've had Gibson as our best starter. You have Logan Gilbert pitching like a freaking bat out of hell. So Look, I, I, I'll, I'll say this real quick, and this is one thing that's absolutely hilarious. It was brought up to, my, uh, to me the other day, and I couldn't refute it. It was fantastic. Uh, way back, I want to say way back, but in 2021, Jared Kelnick and Logan Gilbert both made their debuts on the same day. And both of them were promoted on the same day. And everyone was just so hyped to see Kelnick. Like, oh my gosh, it's Kelnick, it's Kelnick, it's Kelnick. People didn't really give Logan Gilbert that much of a shake. And now we take a look where Kelnick is still struggling, batting currently at the moment, 134. And look, what is Logan Gilbert doing? Well, he's just becoming the best ERA pitcher in baseball, right? Now he's in the American League with a 0.64 ERA. Mind you, Seattle signed a Cy Young Award winner, Robbie Ray, and his ERA is at 4.15. But no, Logan Gilbert has been absolutely ace uh, since, especially at the start of this year. But he's really took that step up. Yeah, yeah, he's been huge. He's been one of the most impressive, not just young pitchers, but pitchers in baseball to start this season. Uh, obviously, also early on um, in 12 games, a guy that's been a good mix in catcher his entire career. Tom Murphy's been good again. Winker needs to get going. Uh, he's had some good at bats, but that's what you expect he's, from Jesse he's, Winker. He's, but, but he's just the almost unlucky guy. That's with Winker right now is that he's just unlucky. Like, you take a look at his barrel rates, you take a look at his exit velos, he's hitting the ball really hard. They're just right at defender. And it's that reminds that me of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, who else does that remind you? There's a billion people that reminds me at this point. Well, no, I was saying uh, because there's uh, someone on our team that he has a bad batting average, and that's why Odubel obviously got put in when he came back and has mm -hmm. been hitting good since. But Veerling, if you look at some of his games with the barrel rate and the hard contact rate... He would literally hit these like ninety mile per hour line drives just to an outfield. So like, like there's yeah. not much you can do when that's the case. <clears throat> exactly, and that's kind of the problem that you just have to kind of deal with is that if the true professionals are going to realize that's what's going on, not let it get to them, and then just go from there, and then they'll, they'll break out of it and get back to where they're at. With and with Winker, one thing that's really cool with him is that yes, the stats don't look amazing for Winker. Like, again, he's only batting 190, but one thing that's really fun to watch with him is, again, it's kind of eye candy test, where he has had some really clutch base hits. Like, he hasn't had the big ball yet. Again, he still hasn't even hit his first home run with the Mariners yet. But seeing what he has done, he has had some huge hits in that big game against uh, Kansas City not long ago where it was double, it was, I believe, double-digit runs for Seattle. I think the final score was like 12, I uh, know it was 13 to 7. He had a defining base hit in that game that really swung the tide for Seattle and kept a huge rally going. He's also hit game-winning hits 
to this season. So with Winker, I am one thing I love about him is that he is a consummate professional. You talk to him, you look at how he plays the game, and he plays like someone who knows the game of baseball inside and out. And it's really cool to see. And so when you see him like get these huge barrels on the bat, so that barrels on the ball and just hit these line drives at 150 miles an hour, and yet they're snagged over at first base. It's a bit disheartening, but you see him, he's just continuing on his path. He's just continuing on, and you just have to wait for that bad luck streak just to kind of die out. Because when you are that good and when you are hitting the ball that hard, that consistently, it's only a, a matter of time until it turns around. That is a good point. Yeah, that's kind of um, a guy that's had some good at-bats for us but hasn't had consistency yet. That, that reminds me of that's a constant professional that I never worry about those guys in terms of get, kicking it back in once they fully find it. He hasn't had as much hard ball rate, so that's the difference between these two. It's Schwarber, but both of them have the similarity personality trait of being those constant professionals that always grind and go, okay, well, I've sucked at this for the past week, so let me get to the cage and do yada, yada, yada. So, like, all those types of guys – that that's what you hear from reading the athletic, reading the score, reading ESPN, reading whatever the hell you read. That's what you hear about those guys. And I never worry about those guys. So like I, I agree with you from that standpoint because Schwarber is different in the sense that he has to have a little bit less swing and miss where um Winker doesn't have that issue nearly uh as much and he can hit for average greatly once he really gets going and probably would still hit at least two seventy and up by the time the season's done. Where Schwarber's not that type of hitter, but they're both just those constant pros that I never worry about them getting back to being what they are and being able to be the full extent of what they are, basically. So I fully get what you're saying there as well. <clears throat> yeah, and another guy, too, that's that also not. Oh, yeah. oh go ahead. Oh, sorry, go. Uh, it's a, and that's kind of what you have to just kind of deal with here is that if you. Baseball is a game of stretches. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. That's what makes it different than football and other major sports. 162 games is a lot. And you have to be able to know there's going to be peaks. There's going to be troughs. And it's about, you know, staying through it. And that's kind of what the difference is, in my opinion, between Jesse Winker and a guy like Jared Kelnick. Where Kelnick's still young, but you see him and he has all the talent in the world. He has all the ability and he even does hit the ball pretty hard a lot of the time. But the problem with Kelly right now is that his mentality is still just, he's yet to have that full confidence in himself. And it's turned into really streaky play. Whereas Jesse Winker is a guy that I have very little doubt is going to be one of the better players on this Mariner roster when the end of the season comes to pass. And it's all just about, you know, making sure that you're doing the work that you got to do. You're making sure that you just got to keep on grinding. Just keep on grinding. Exactly. Yeah, it's a grind. It's not a, it's not a sprint. It's not bowling where you have just one game. It's not tennis where you have just a few sets. This is 162 games in a season. You just got to keep on going. No, I completely agree with that. Um. And that's why I think, and when it's all said and done, from a different perspective, from power to RBI guy, for our guy, your guy, an all-around hitter, I think both of them are going to be the some of the more successful players on the team in the end when it comes to Schwarber for my Phillies and when it comes to Winker for your Mariners. And also, the big part of the Mariners is you guys are a game above 500 without <clears> – you have Ty France hitting on all cylinders who, if he can and he's a hit like this, better when the, the – talked about is i forget do we have players of the month in baseball yes we do yeah we should be getting players we do, we of the month do. pretty soon and i think yeah, that yeah. france so, yeah, is yeah. definitely going to be yeah. a consideration for that one yeah he should be getting that because i'm so in the <clears throat> i i i be, i i know hockey had it and i remembered i thought baseball had it so it's good to see they still have it but yeah he should get the he should get the player of the month but one of my favorite just contact rate hitters in the league because I always liked those Jeff McNeil um, type, the Tommy Edmonds who's having a killer season early type hitters because you have to mix those guys into your lineup. They can't be your full lineup in today's era, but you still want to have a couple guys that are just contact killers as well. Well, the Mariners, you guys have a couple of them where one guy that hasn't even got going yet in your game above 500 is Adam Frazier. And the way that he carries himself <clears throat> as well, 
and um it's and the way that he seems to just be a master for it that being able to just take the pitch the other way and all that i feel like he's gonna get going to the extent of being at least again like a 270 up something by the end and he'll be a guy that's a good fielder in the field as well he's one of those <coughs> excuse me undervalue players i think because he's not the current age popping player that everybody likes that's why Edmonds undervalued too but he's a guy that you love to have in your lineup because he's one of those guys that's just always going 100 and uh is always going to be trying to figure out why he's not having the best step and you can tell he knows he's not the most talented overall guy out there that he seems to be one of those guys just like the McNeils and Edmonds of the world who overwork on their craft basically just because they have to because they know they're not the current age, McNeil started hitting more home runs, but he's still more of a contact guy at heart. Like all those guys are not what everybody thinks is the sexy player in the current age. But in my opinion, you still have to have guys like that on your team. And I think Adam Frazier and your lineup mixes in perfectly. I agree with you. And that's kind of something that's really interesting here with Frazier. Go back to the beginning of the season, like the first week, he was not turning the cover off the ball per se. But he was hitting the ball extremely effectively. He was getting base hit after base after base hit, hitting into gap after gap after gap. And it was honestly incredible to watch because he was the guy that at any point you wanted to see what he was going to do. At any point during a game, if you saw him come up to the plates, you're like, okay, we're going to get a good at bat right here. Like there was a recent game I actually went to. It was between uh, Seattle and Houston where Verlander was on the mound. Now, Verlander would go on to have an incredible game, pitching, basically pitching a shutout while he was going on. And the only hit for a good while was a leadoff single by Adam Frazier. So that's kind of the that's kind of the thing right now with this team, is that there's a lot of players that can do a lot of these kind of just contact roles these kind of ones that are just get on base and do your job and Frazier is definitely one of them Frazier does has definitely cooled off since that first couple weeks now batting just just under 240 but still really he's not slugging the ball at all he has an on-base percentage of 307 and a slugging of 315 I think that um I, I, I think you see what that means like He's he's just a guy that's going to try to get on first base. And you know what? From the beginning of the season, he was doing fantastic at that. I want to see him kind of turn around back because he has kind of struggled and defensively has not looked the best. But I'm okay with that. But that's rare for him, too. Like, that's not typical of Adam Frazier because I know, um, like, even though they're a bad team, they're still – a team that has a rich history, and I'm a big baseball history guy that I still root for the Pirates to get back to not sucking. Um, so, like, since they're one of the teams in my state, and I do all like, I don't like the Penguins at all, but I don't mind the Pirates and the state of Pittsburgh, or the city of Pittsburgh, I should say. Uh, I always liked watching him there where I had, like, he was one of those guys, like, when I would get the at bat alerts, he was just one of those cool guys to watch at bat because he's kind of the old school hitter where you always had these guys that are going for the uppercut, hit it out of the ballpark. And you just mentioned his slugging percentage. He's one of those guys that ain't worried about that. Just like Edmund, he's like, okay, cool. This guy's on base. Let me get him to third. Not enough guys, I think, in today's game think like that anymore. 100% agree. And that's kind of the thing right now. I. I've always kind of been a fan of the contact guys. Like, it's always fun to have the big power bat. It's always good to have, you know, a good couple of them in the lineup. But I want guys that are going to put constant pressure on these pitchers. I want guys that are going to get on base, are going to work around to get other people on base, so I move them around, and then bring them in. And then, you know what, on top of it, get on base so the big power, the big power guys can just knock them all in with one swing of the bat. A three-run home run is better than a one-home run, one-run home run, like as the oh uh, yeah, as the Atlanta we know that are well. so well to know right now. Well, they're, they're they're so well to know that this year, but in Philly, we know that all too well from Harper last year, most of his damn home <laughs> run to why he didn't even have the RBIs. Like that's why when some people are like, oh, he didn't have the RBIs and most MVPs, it's like, well, no crap, he didn't have the RBIs and most MVPs. Nobody got the hell on base. Like, exactly. like, if he would have, if they were on base, because when they were, he was hitting them in, they were just rarely there. 
<laughs> but like, so no, I completely agree with you when it comes to that. But on that premise of power guys, I want the best at contact. I have to ask you, what's your take on uh, Eugenio Suarez's start to the season and how you think he's going to end up adjusting over time with the Mariners? Because I'm just curious to hear that. Honestly, I love what Suarez has been doing. Suarez has been someone that at the beginning of the season really struggled. That's why his numbers look a little lower than what they actually are. But he still right now has an OPS plus of over 100 at 118 curling at the moment. I and like 100 is the lead average, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. 100 is the lead average. He's at 118. And for a player that is basically a comeback player of the year candidate, like, I like that. Especially considering the fact that, you know, with the contract that he has, a lot of people said that the only way how they were going to be able to get Winker is to also take Suarez. And I just thought to myself, why wouldn't you want that? Suarez, yes, he is not the absolute best defender. Yes, he's not a great contact guy, but man, the guy can mash. And you need oh, a yeah. replacement at third base for Kyle Seager. Kyle Seager was an elite defender, and it's going to suck not having that elite defense. But I've been watching Suarez, and he's actually looked pretty good. Defensively, he has not looked bad. He's been making the plays. He hasn't looked like a liability. Like other players, you know, have started to, like sadly, Frazier. I'm not going to say he's been a li- liability, but he's not looked the best, which is, you say, again, uncharacteristic. But a lot of you are, were saying that Suarez is going to be that liability, and he hasn't been, which makes me, you know, very happy indeed. So I like what I see from Suarez right now. The bat's really starting to heat up. Um, I think no, I feel sad that like, nobody gets my reference whenever I call him Matt Hardy. But I love what I've seen. He's got a swagger to him, but he's also always seems like he's in control, you know? He's the kind of guy that always looks like when he's at the dish, he's the one in charge of that at-bat. And that's something that's so rare to see. He's a good hitter, one that has already driven in 11 or aside for second on the team. The only – he's tied currently actually with Adam Frazier. For most uh, for second most RBIs on the team, not even a question that who's number one, Ty France. But I love what I'm seeing from it's been honestly really fun watching Schwartz. I was high on him at the beginning of the season, and I'm still high on him now one month in. Yeah, I think he's played the profile too because he's a power RBI guy. Like he's better than 190 last year, but he's still at the 33 or 30 whatever homers. I think it was 33, but uh. He still mashed. He just <clears> that's what he is, excuse me. He's the Schwarber of your team, basically. Like you have but he has a better he can but the thing with Suarez is that Schwarber's not nearly as good at doing. When he's at his best, I think Suarez has a better ability to go the other way as well. Mm-hmm. Where Kyle Schwarber doesn't have as best of ability. He can do it sometimes, but I don't think he has a good of ability as Suarez to have pop the other way, but that's just my own opinion. Oh, yeah, no. I, I, to be fair, kind of, if we're going with the idea of Schwarber, we have two Schwarbers on the team in uh, Suarez and in Winker. Like, both that's of them, a fair point, except for Winker, though, throughout his career. Is like a career. Yeah, although Winker, though, I give more credit like I did when I compared him to Schwarber contact rate-wise because he has throughout his career. Schwarber's a 230-something career. I'm pretty sure Winker's over 250. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, no, I would definitely so, say that Winker is better than Schwarber, but that with that kind of same, you know, uh, archetype, I, I definitely give it more to Winker than, but they do at least, you know, fit the, they fit the bill. So Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. you guys also, as we'll wrap up on your team, and then we'll go to mine, and then we'll jump to other teams. You guys have also had Castillo pitching great. Swanson's pitching great. Steckenrider's been good. Munoz, who we know is going to be great in the end, has been good already. Uh, Mezowitz, uh, the name that I hate trying Masevich. to say, but he's pitched Masevich. well. Yeah, yeah. Masevich, okay. Uh, Seawold, uh, even Mills. You guys have kind of been like the Phillies. You've got these depth relievers that started – Pitching like we had these, like the Norwoods of the world and the Bellatis. So when you have everybody in your pen, minus uh, minus the fact that Matt Brash has pitched bad for you guys, uh, when you have uh, everybody, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say he's pitched bad. He's had the rookie struggles, uh, okay. which are very because if you've watched his stuff, it's good. Like again, that slider he has is one of the most biting sliders in all of baseball. 
The problem right now is that he's just learning how to adapt to get to major league hitting. It's all about positioning for him. He's left a lot of pitches over the plate. It's just about he needs okay. to learn how to locate a little bit better. But uh, so yeah, sense. I mean, like just look at the stats. Yeah, it looks bad, but that's I think just rookie jitters. No, that makes sense because you see that from a lot of guys. And yeah, I mean, I know from paying attention to prospects lists. Uh, the um, like he they do grade his slider as one of the better <clears throat> sliders among youngsters. So it all is about putting it together. Uh, and then Flexen has pitched solid this far, and you expect Flexen to be solid. You nobody expects Chris Flexen, mm-hmm. I think, to be immaculate. Like he's more of just one of those guys that is a solid pitcher. And I'm sure Mac is still pissed off by the fact that he's becoming a solid pitcher for the Mariners and <laughs> sucks for the match. Uh, but uh, I don't. He's um, not so much bad because it's just more the fact of. Like, okay, well, if he's going to be bad, he, he became better overseas and then came back okay. So he's not even mad about it anymore, but our good friend Mac also on Overtime Heroics. Shout out to Mac. But, um, no, I mean, he's not mad about it anymore, but he's definitely like, it couldn't have been this here, buddy. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, his only problem is he should still be walking out the flexicution, but, you know, other than that... Uh... <laughs> He's doing doing a pretty good job. Um, But when we wrap up, we'll we'll gloss over. Uh, My team, it's been interesting because we've had guys that have impressed me. Like, Cassiano started off really good lately. His average dipped under 300, but I expect him to continue to just match. He's Nick freaking Cassiano's. Uh, He even talked about it in his press conference where, like, I can't remember the exact quote, but, like, Basically, like, he didn't go to college. He's like, I just learned how to hit baseballs or something like that. Like, um, <laughs> so, like, you know. He's I had just daggers. A uh, Hoskins oh, yeah. is better than his struggles right now. Uh, we'll see. And then Real Muto went down after having a great start. Schwarber had some good swings in the Mets series, so we'll see if that gets him going. Camargo went down after a good start. Bone's been hitting great overall, and after he said, I effing hate this place has been one of the better players on the entire team in general and actually has started fielding his position adequately. So it's amazing how that works. Um, <clears throat> and uh, because he handled the media really well, I honestly think that's uh, that situation was so funny because no other athlete that said something like that in Philly has dealt with it that well. And this is coming from like a 24-year-old kid too, which is the more hilarious thing. Um, yeah, and, he, and he dealt with it so well that I think everyone's like, hmm. Oh, good shit. Oh. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah, okay, no, I yeah, don't really know what to say. Cool. Like, 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 hey, like, like, I don't really know what to say because, <laughs> I'm like, kidding, I'm... like, I feel, I feel like, no, I feel like most people were just like, hey, he just owned it and nobody else did that. I felt like they expected it to be, like, a good player saying the version of what Sean Rodriguez did where he was just not ever going to own it. Well, but, like, then you would have still had to deal with that differently because Sean Rodriguez sucked. And now mm-hmm. Alec Boehm was still one of the better hitters on the team at the time before he started fielding better. But it's amazing how he dealt with that greatly. And then the confidence the fans put in him, he got a standing ovation coming back in because of how well he handled in the media. That's all our town. And I know Seattle's a blue-collar town, too, so I'm sure you have some similarities to this. But that's all we really won here. It's like if you screw up and say something like that, just own it. And yeah, he exactly. did. And then- like- that's the thing. Literally. Like, whenever you deal with the media, you never want to be like, you know, oh, I didn't say that. You can't deny it. Like everyone, everyone heard you. Everyone saw you. You gotta say, you know what? Yeah, I said it in the heat of the moment. I apologize. Let's rock and roll. And do yeah, something, I... say something to the point where it's like, you know what? Yeah, just like you said, just own it. If you said it, like you know, understand that you know, yeah, you made a mistake. But. Then it's afterwards it has to be, you know, shown through your actions. And that's the part that I need that I am pressing has shown it is through the actions. So as long as he keeps that up, then things should be fully okay with Bone. Yeah. And what I really liked early from a surprise factor, not because he's fielded well, Garrett Stubbs has fielded well his entire uh, career from the minors to the majors, but the fact of in the game he's been in this far, I thought his at bats have been great. Um, which has been a thing of him in the minors, not so much in the majors. Uh, so it's been nice to see him grow the patience at the plate and ability to not get over anxious 
at the big league level, which was a trade he had in the minors to the big league level. So it's been nice to see that as a backup catcher because we have two of some of the fastest freaking catchers in baseball. Uh, if Garrett Stubbs can actually stay and be a backup catcher, so uh, <laughs> it's also nice to have. It's also nice to have that. Camargo's been a pleasant surprise. He's going back down to 268, but I don't expect him to hit 310 in the season. Obviously, I expect him to hit more 268 to like around that realm. Uh, Gregorius has been very good coming off of his injury, which has been nice to see. And that's what's allowed Scott, after struggling, to go back down and find it down there, which I think he will. I'm still high on him, but uh, I think having DD being this good is actually perfect because then that allows Stott to be as mature as possible when he comes up in the future. So I think that actually worked out to a T. The mm -hmm. man, the myth, the speedster, uh, Roman Quinn is back um, after starting with the uh, Marlins. And actually has been – the problem with Roman Quinn isn't talent. It's just stay the hell on the field. <laughs> as long as I, he can do you that. You can say to a lot of players um, right now. Mitch oh, Andrew. there's a lot of guys um, that have injury, but, but like Quinn – because he's still clocked after two big lower body injuries. Like, he's still clocked as, like, the fifth quickest runner, I think they said on the telecast the other day. First to th – or first to uh, – home to first, I should say. And so, like, he still got it, and he's a guy that's a perfect sub-in for the field because Odubel Herrera is very bad at back track. Coming in on the ball, he's fine. But ever since he's come <clears throat> back into baseball after his legal issues – um. He's not been the same fielder at all, and he's only solid at coming in on the ball. Going back on the ball, he runs routes that are like a freaking seventh receiver that had to get subbed into the second receiver spot because every receiver's injured on an NFL team. And you're just like, what the heck is this dude doing? Like, <laughs> so I think hitting wise with what he's doing, he has to stay as a starter. But I like how we have Veerling and Quinn as our backups that are both field first guys. And then Veerling has the contact rate that I think is going to get his average. It's not going to be like 300 like it was last year when he came up to the end of the season, but get his average to being adequate. And then Quinn's also started with a lot of good at-bats. So I like I like how we have that mix where Odubel's the best hitter out of them all, but clearly the least fielder. And then you have uh, Quinn, and then who's not the best route runner as a fielder, but makes up for it with speed. And then Veerling, I would say, is the best at like in terms of being able to actually run the most – adequate routes to the ball and he's also mm -hmm. one of those like good striders that gets there so he's yeah. a little bit different than Quinn. Quinn's one of those small guys that just looks like Sonic while uh <coughs> running out there but no and then to wrap it up with my team though Gibson's been impressive Nola actually has been better than people give him credit for I think because he's one of the only guys in the league this far not one of the only guys but one of the select guys in the league I should say as a starter that's whip is below uh, one so like he's been doing stuff right it's just he still has that inning where you're like well son of a so like if he can get out of having that one inning that magnifies his pitch count that only lets him go five and two thirds or just six innings and not like the old school nolo that we saw at the beginning of his career then yeah that's going to limit him but the reason that hasn't been as big of an issue early is gibson's been going deep and then Wheeler and Suarez, their last time out, who's pitching right now, Ranger Suarez, um, had their best outing. So that gives me hope, I think. And the fact that the bullpen's pitching great. Dominguez has had up and down, but his whip is great. But he's had a couple outings that <clears throat> magnified his ERA. Uh, the same goes with Yuri's Familia. So I think Dombrowski's formed a better overall component here. The thing is, it's similar to your Mariners. And that's why we talked about our two teams comparing them first because of their similarities, nobody's got hot altogether yet. And yeah, no. Once that that's, happens, that can really be a recipe for great success. Definitely. And with, with Nola, I agree with you 100%. And I equate Nola to the golfer that is really good but has one blow-up hole that just destroys the scorecard. It's the same thing. That's a where, perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect. Yeah, because thing. Noah is a pitcher that you know that when he's on, he's on. But you just know that at some point during the game, there's just going to be one inning. One inning where everything just kind of falls apart. And he'll be fine the next inning. But it's still going to amplify that ERA. That's why it's at just barely sub four right now. But if you're able to get rid of that one inning, then you're going to have a dominated performance. So for Nola, it's all just about that. I love what, like, I, like you said, I like what Gibson's been doing. Wheeler's still, I think, just needs a little bit, needs, needs to calm down a little bit right now. His ERA's at just a 
barely. Well, his it. issue is his issue was I also he was coming off of his injury, and he's a beamer that obviously is a is a guy that utilizes now knowing how to pitch and not just gunning it. But like those guys, I feel like take longer. Where the reason I think Ranger was able to kind of battle through starts and still give you the four and two thirds, five innings before he pitched six the last time out was he's not that he's, he's like the cliff Lee style of pitcher. That's going to go East West and get you out with his stuff and ability to throw it in the strike zone and let the guys do the work. Well, obviously I'm not saying he's ever going to be as good as cliff Lee. I'm just saying the style of pitcher where when you're mm-hmm. Ranger Suarez, that that's quicker, I think to come back from injury and look and and get going it's just he hasn't had his command yet where we only have to worry about the command getting your velo up if you're a ranger you're more just worried about your command because you don't worry about velo that much anyway with the type of pitcher he is so one thing i will bring up a little bit with the bullpen here i look at these names here and just so from an outsider's perspective look at these guys Corey nebel sir anthony dominguez uh jury Familia, jose alvarado and brad hand would you say those are the main relievers uh yeah, um, those are the main guys. Plus, um, this year, uh, he's pitched uh, in a decent bit of games for us. Joe Girardi as a middle reliever, it's been the best you've ever seen out of Nick Nelson too as a middle reliever. I don't think he's ever going to be anything better than that. But like, he's had a couple rounds where he's pitched three innings for us, four good innings for us, and I think that's an underrated thing to do too if you can find that guy in your pen that can piggyback your starters when needed and pitch. Even if he gives up one run in those three, four innings, he's still keeping you in the game and can be a valuable innings eater out of the pen. So I think those are the main guys, but I also think a surprise guy because when I did the video on him in the off season, I know from talking about the other guys we had, he was more of a concern because of his control issues in the past where he's actually so- had better control this season where uh, Emmanuel Coonrod, uh, Joe, Joe, and Ryan Sheriff, who were all out, I thought those guys had a better chance to make it, but all, also all those guys were out. So I feel like he got put in by default and is taking advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. So with those main guys that we mentioned, there's one thing that kind of unites all of them. They're all kind of reclamation projects. Corey Neville was a guy that did pretty good work overall, through, especially with Milwaukee. So I think Dominguez coming off of last year as well. Jury's Familia, I mean, we all know about his, you know, Drug usage. Off the field and stuff, yeah. Off the field stuff. Jose Alvarado, a really good reliever, but just has problems getting lit up, as well as Brad Hand, who, again, at his peak, was one of the best in baseball, but has since fallen off. What's What I like to see here, and what I think is very much a double-edged sword, is that all of them are guys that have something to prove. All of them are players yeah. that, you know, have been tossed aside through one through one side or another, or are still trying to find their place, which it, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because yes, that gives them the motivation to really keep going. The problem is there's reasons why they haven't been, you know, the number one guy on another team or haven't been, you know, well, that's why I think we have a teams. good mix. Yeah. Exactly. That's why I that's think what's... Dombrowski formed this as like a perfect blend because we don't have that one, other than right now, Knable, I feel like, has the ability to be that one stud because coming off of Tommy John, guys nowadays, because of how good the surgery is, not that you obviously ever want to have to get Tommy John, but when you get it, it's not like damning like it was in the past. And you get to work so much with the way that technology is on your lower body and all that, that sometimes you're stronger as a whole human coming back, where Knable looks like a beast. But a guy that's also been impressive, along with Bellotti, who is a great comeback story after his car accident and all that stuff that Andrew Bellotti had off the field. Now he's having a cool comeback story uh, with the Phillies. So I, I wish him continued success because that's a great story if that happens. Uh, plus, uh, we have another very good pitcher that's just kind of a strike thrower, not something that's going to wow you, but just kind of controls the zone. And we used to, with Glenn Tech, get too many of those guys. Well, nowadays, you have to have the filthy stuff, but you still want a couple of the Bellottis and James Norwoods mixed into your bullpen because then when you need those guys that can just kind of calm the storms and throw strikes well there you go you actually have those guys to go to rather than guys that sometimes all get wild so i like that because norwood also has been great this year he just has a high ura because he pitched like crap in that may first game against the mets but otherwise uh he's been fantastic as well coming over from the cubbies 
And he wasn't really a pleasant surprise because he, when I got to do research on him and do savant baseball savant and other stuff and watch scouting tapings up before I did my video on the off season, he seemed like a guy that just never got a full chance and not one of those guys that you just thought came out of nowhere. So I feel like he's just also taking advantage of the opportunity similar to Nelson where the pleasant surprise was Bellotti because he was away from being in the majors for a while after he pitched years ago in like 15. And then he came back with the fish. And then oddly enough, his debut with the Phillies, if I remember correctly, I believe was against the fish and he pitched great against them. So it's amazing how things come into the full circles there, but that that's kind of a closing point I would have with my team that, that, that I I'm confident that once everything gets clicking similar to you that we're, have it because we have these depth guys. It's kind of like a perfect mix. Just like your bullpen is kind of like a perfect mix because you have guys with stuff to prove as well, as well as Ken Giles. When he comes back from injury, he wants to prove he can, one, stay on the field, but two, still be uh, the great Ken Giles. Yeah, definitely. And one thing I will say with my team, at least before we get going here on talking about the rest of the baseball world, is I want to bring up something that just I love talking about because we talked about Ty France. We talked about all of uh, kind of the offense that's been going around right now for Seattle. I want to revisit for just a brief moment the trade that took place in 2020 between the Seattle Mariners and the San Diego Padres. The reason why I want to bring it up is because of what it meant for Seattle now. Um, in that trade, a lot of people said that Seattle won, and I agree at the time, definitely Seattle still won. But Seattle, but the Padres were really trying to get something, trying trying to get an upgrade at catcher. And so Seattle sent away Austin Nola, uh, then relievers, De- um, Austin Adams, and Dan Altavilla. In those games, right, Austin Nola has, you know, still remained as one of their main catchers. He's had a couple little bit of injury problems, but he's still on the he's, – he's still past his age 30 season. Then Austin Adams has played a little bit. He's not okay, but he has a career war right now of point of point nine, and on this season of point one. So not a whole lot that's been, you know, middling. And Dan Altavilla hasn't really pitched for them. In fact, hasn't pitched a game for them yet this year. So which I yeah, he's been in the injury. minors. I injury said, reminds. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think he's in. I think he's in. Yeah, he's actually he was banged he's up. On the 60 I, day, I thought, he's on the sixty day. He's on the sixty day. Okay, he he is still banged up. They put him on the sixty because they. He's the guy that I remember for my video that I was going to do on like guys that could be because he has the stuff. He never could just put it together. Mm-hmm. I was going to do like one of those dark horse videos, but like. I just could never get the damn injury update thing on him. And then, okay, so the, he is on the 60 day. Yeah, and then so yeah, Adams is one of those on, just, so. yeah, Adams is one of those, like, like you said, like he's not anything bad, but he's also nothing special. Like he's one of those, maybe he'll eat some innings for you, go to like a three, five ERA out of the pen, four ERA, like one of those guys. That's a, that's a good guy to have again, but nothing spectacular. Mm-hmm. But that's the other thing with with Adams is that, to be fair, that's kind of Seattle's fault. Seattle rushed him up, and he had some real electric stuff, just couldn't put it all together. And with all the villa, he just kept getting injured. The reason why I want to bring that up, though, is because of what Seattle got back in that trade. In that trade, they got back Ty France, who is now one of the best hitting first basemen in baseball at the moment. You got back Luis Torrens who has been one of the best DHs with Seattle and another decent catcher for the team that can still, you know, do pretty well overall. And they also got back a couple other people. They got back, oh, I don't know, one of the best young relievers in baseball, Andres Munoz, who right now is one of, I think, only a couple players in baseball right now, that their average fastball velocity is over 100 miles an hour. And they also got Taylor Trammell, who is, again, a good young depth guy that when he has shown to, to get his chance, he's done decently well. Not amazing, mind you, but decently well in his great organizational depth. And he has a lot of room to grow, and you guys have the players on the MLB roster that give him that time to grow, too. So Exactly. So, and it's, it's a little sad for him just because, again, how stacked Seattle's outfield really is right now. So he's just not going to be getting too much of a chance. But it's great organizational depth and even a little bit of trade bait. But I like what I'm seeing here from this team. And that trade is honestly, in my opinion, one of the things that set up Seattle for long-term success. 
during that 2020 season. And we're seeing it really start to show, especially just the trade would have been a win for Seattle if if it was just uh, even if it was just France, Munoz, and Torrens, like even if it was just France and Munoz, I would have said it was a, a would have said it was a win. But no, getting all those people, I think, should really show that you know Seattle is here to win, and Seattle has shown that through these guys, they are ready to win. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think um, now we've uh, beat to a death our teams. Uh, we can go to one team that I'm surprised in the negative with, because uh, uh, we've been talking a lot of positives on our two teams, how we think they're going to turn around. I have to say, is the Texas Rangers. Um, <laughs> the Texas Rangers have gotten off to a ver- – now, Corey Seager's hit fine. Marcus Simeon's been very bad early, uh, which I don't think he's going to stay like that. I do think he'll get going again. Uh, Nathaniel Lau has been great. Don't ask me why. I just said his whole first name instead of just Nate. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Andy Abanez has also been hitting well for them as well, all kind of an emerging guy that's in his late 20s that's been surprisingly – not. I don't know if I want to say surprisingly. That might be rude, but has been an unexpected su- success guy to start the season. Uh, but they just haven't had any depth hitting. Like Nobody consistently – like Solak usually is more of a guy that – at least from following him throughout his minor leagues and all everything that's supposed to be a slap guy that can hit for contact. Now he's going too much for trying to hit the liners. I think that is not his, like hitting the liners low is his strength, but like he's not playing to his strengths basically. Uh, Because he's on base, he still has a 341. So like he's having good at bats, it's just now he has to hit to his strength. Uh, The thing I see with Texas overall is that they spent $500 million of the offseason to finish fourth in the American League West. They're fifth right now. But that's honestly just because the Athletics have been on a kind of a, I don't want to say a tear, because they're still, you know, three games below 500. But they've definitely outdone performances. Like, they've definitely already done, gone better than what people expected of them. And well, I, I expected the Rangers to be great this year. Like, I picked them oh. in I picked. And first, if you're married, I'm, I'm sorry. Year. I'm sorry, Joe, but I'm going to laugh at you. I'm going to laugh at you because in no way, shape, or form were the Rangers going to be great this year. They added, yes, they added both Simeon and, yes, they added both Simeon and Seager, but you can't win a game with two players. You really can. The team just lacks everything else. Like, there's still a good few years out from being even remotely contenders. I'm sorry, man. Well, I I also like how their team they now none of them really made the roster, and I thought they would be better in spring training. But they have some young pitching still; they just haven't cracked it yet. So, yeah, you might be right; they might be a couple of years out. I also thought John Gray would not flat out suck early, and he hasn't been that good yet. But I he'll probably get going a little bit more. Um, so, I mean. Yeah, they haven't been a success story. Where Matt Moore is one of your best pitching pitches early. That's not the best That's thing. That's a sad time. Uh, but like the reason I thought I thought they were going to be one of those twins teams that because they also have Lau that has power, they have Garcia who has power, that were going to be able to hit enough. And then Martin Perez is one of those kind of gamer pitchers. Dane Dunning's one of those guys that just is able to battle through and get you the innings. So like they have those guys. They just had to find the top of the line guy. And I also have always away from Coors thought John Gray would do better. And he still has time to do that. But mm-hmm. so far that hasn't worked out yet because I thought he was a guy that will do well away from Coors, but he hasn't done that yet. So we'll have to see going forward. There's still a lot of time, but yeah, they have been very unimpressive. Really. Yeah. So they, John Gray, I think can do well. My problem with him is that with Coors, yeah, it's always going to be a bit of a crapshoot just because you don't know, how well it's going to do when you take away the quote-unquote cores effect, which I still think is kind of booty anyway. Um, but when you have all those players, you can't win if you don't have enough. And that's the thing. They, it's like they spent so much money in the offseason to basically acquire a middle infield. That's all you got out of it. You got, you know, a decent pitcher in John Gray that you're hoping to be an ace, but he doesn't have the stuff to be an ace. Like, even if you are in cores, you still have to show the stuff 
to be an ace. And he, well, no, no, no. But I thought he was a good. He, I think he always showed this stuff to be a good two. And they don't really have, like I said, they have those battler pitchers like the Dunnings. They had another one like Perez. Those guys are more three fours or four mm-hmm. fives. So it would have been nice to in a rotation like there's other rotations that don't have like your quote unquote like Chris Bassett was never really a purified ace, but he was the ace ace because of mm-hmm. what they turned him into. And now he's more in the position that I think most would say is suited for him in a rotation, being a great pitcher in the rotation, but not the main kahuna, basically. So, like, I feel like I agree with you there, but I just thought I, I was just more confident in their lineup. But, yeah, I mean, it's not mm-hmm. it's not working out. The Also, the thing is, other than your team – in the AL West, I thought because of how much, like, there's a thing to be said about the feel of the locker room and everything, and you could tell how heartbroken the Astros were when they lost Correa, because a lot of guys thought they were going to keep him. I thought they were going to have, that was going to have a bigger effect on the Strohs early, which it kind of has, because in all hindsight, they're just the same record as you guys, and the whole AL West didn't really get off to the sexiest overall start where the angels are 15 and nine in first place. But mm-hmm. I, that's also why I think I put them higher because I thought the rest of the division minus your Mariners were not going to be the best this year, just because I thought that effect was going to affect the Astros a little bit more because they all kind of see, like, I, I, I kind of look at that more than I think most people the like momentum strides and waves of a locker room because of that type of crap. Oh no, I totally get that. And that's kind of the, on the bit here is that with Carlos Correa leaving the team, it definitely did have a bit of a butterfly effect when it comes to the locker room, when it comes games comes to all that, but they weren't able to pay him. And that's just kind of what the what it turned into. And it's a business. You gotta be able to do that. And Correa isn't a great clubhouse guy to, unless it's with the Astros. He's gonna have more effect on the Astros than he would on any other team. Definitely has more than he does on the twins right now, even though the twins are still currently leading the AL Central. I do think overall, though, that the team, the Astros are still a good team. In my opinion, right now, they are in the right position. Like, if the season were to end right now, the only team that's actually, that actually matches up my prediction are the Strohs at second place. And they're doing, you know, they're doing all right. They are definitely blossoming with having, or definitely, I should say, thriving from having a, um, a revitalized Justin Verlander absolutely just completely revived his career. Well, that's the and, other reason I put them in third because I didn't think I thought Verlander would not be bad because he's Justin Verlander, but I didn't think he would be Cy Young Justin Verlander again after not pitching a year and a half. I'm curious there. What were your what were your standings at the beginning of the season? If you thought the Rangers were going to be amazing this year, what I, I I'm so curious. I need to know this, Joe. Uh, mine for the West was I had the Rangers, then I had your Mariners, then I had the Astros, the Angels. I just the other thing is I thought the Angels on paper were better than the Rangers, but the Rangers were going to have the Allard and other young pitchers kind of step up more in spring training, and then they all were kind of still showed they had to have more AAA time. So that's also what kind of bit me in the ass with that prediction. So I didn't get the the young pitchers didn't uh, progress as quickly as I thought either. So that's the big reason there. But the Angels I had at fourth because they just always tend to show a lot of promise, and then it just doesn't go in their direction in the end. That's but. We'll have to see what happens in the end. There's still a lot of room to grow, but I had mm-hmm. Rangers, M, Strohs, Angels, Athletics, and that's and then for the NL West, uh, the NL West was kind of the toughest to pick because of the top. I didn't think the Rockies would get off this good of a start, but like the top, uh, the top four were pretty solid teams that the Rockies added the lineup, and then if they're pitching with their young guys, was good enough, but. Like the, I had the Giants because I like how I talk about that clubhouse thing and their connectivity. I I believe in that. Then the Dodgers, so I kind of had it the same as last year, and then the Padres, and then the Rockies and the D-backs. I think that was literally the same standings as last year. So yeah, for me, I had it as Dodgers, uh, Giants, Padres, Rockies, Diamondbacks for the NL West. Yeah, so that one, the AL Central, or the excuse me, the NL Central. I had Brewers, Cards, Cubs, Reds, and Pirates where the Pirates might actually be better than the Reds this year, so good for them. 
<laughs> yeah, my my problem with the NL Central is it's like trying to pick between the several different turds, basically, because there was not a whole lot of talent here. In my opinion, it was the Brewers division, and the Cardinals were going to compete with them, kind of. And that's then, exactly how I looked at it. Yeah, that's. Exactly and then the rest of the three teams were basically competing to see who's going to suck the worst. And obviously, in this one, in my opinion, it was the Reds. And so far, I am very right on that. As they have a three and nineteen record on this season. Let me say that yeah, one they've time. Been the they are twenty-two games the into the season. They're three and nineteen. Oh my gosh! Like yeah, and the funny thing is, the Brewers haven't even. It's not like overall, if you look at the team, they've hit immensely great this year. They kind of just got the timely hitting and their pitching as expected. Like they have very good pitchers on that team. And that's kind of what come to fruition. You have the Corbin mm-hmm. Burns uh, pitching really well. You have Lauer turning into a very good pitcher. Uh, mm-hmm. Adrian Hauser's pitching well. We're just struggling early, but you know, he's going to get going. So and like, they, they have as a well. Yeah. There. Yeah. They still have Peralta. Obviously they still got a hater in the uh, pen. Williams is better than what he's showing. Cousins has stuff if he can put it together. So they have good pitchers. I think they were – the reason I picked them at first was their staff, combined with the mm-hmm. fact that I think their hitters are going to – like the Willie Adamas, as he's got, gone there, have been better. He hasn't got off to the hottest start, but Renfro's coming off of a great year. He started to get going a bit. I feel like Yelich is going to start doing at least solid again. So I feel like they have that. But I do think it's going to be kind of a battle to the end. I do think it's going to be a close division just like it is right now between them and the Cardinals. And then the Cubs are kind of just a buy a default because they were kind of this limbo team where they made moves that they were retooling. And then they'd be like, oh, the Cubs just added this guy. And you're like, oh, really? So, like, uh, the by default, I was just like, okay, cool. Yeah, they're the third place team because I don't think either the Pirates or the Reds are going in third place. Yeah, for me, like, the Brewers were obviously the number one just because their staff was so good. I mean, when you have a top three of your rotation that is comprised of Corbin Burns, Brendan Woodruff and Freddie Peralta, that's a that's a dominating one, two, three. Like, and on top of it, having, you know, the relief arms, like again, having a guy like Lauer, having guys like Hayter and Williams and Hauser, all these people doing just amazing work. Well, Lauer I mean, started this year, though. That's the that's the no, yeah, La- yeah. I just was saying a bunch of names on that one. Yeah. Um it's he dominated us even. Like he he they made him into that that's the that's the thing. Like, Lauer was a guy that had to always be a strike thrower because obviously he doesn't have the fireball stuff. But And he had a little bit of that with the Padres, but the he they never seemed to get him to be able to be the – utilize the strike zone to the best of your abilities and let your guys play to the best of their abilities behind you and mix in – like, basically be the magician-type pitcher that mixes in your pitches like he does now east-west – North South, and that's what's made him great with it. With the Padres, they never seem to get him to that level where he just kind of threw the strikes, but threw too many money ball strikes. Mm-hmm. Where then the hitters would hit him. Where now uh, with the Brewers, he started showing signs of it last year because I remember him being a good fantasy pickup last mm-hmm. season at times of the mm-hmm. season. And then this year, he's just hit the ground running like a bat out of hell, and is one of the more impressive lefties and. In, in baseball just as a starter to start the season. And it's not like – and he's just one of those guys that knows how to throw it in the strike zone but throw effective strikes and has a good breaking ball. So I, I like when those guys are able to have success because those guys aren't talked about enough when we always just talk about the Chris Sale fireball is where – I love talking about those guys too, but it's nice to give the guys like Lauer that profile like that, the uh, props when they deserve them as well. Definitely, yeah. So then now moving on to the East – divisions on both sides here for the NL East. Personally, right now, I love what the Mets are doing. I am very much in favor of them. Sorry about the Phillies and all that fun stuff, but the Mets really... I had us in third anyway, so I don't... Yeah, that's so you're I in the right place on that one. I feel bad the Braves are, because they've actually hit more solo shots than any team in baseball, but that means they've also hit more solo shots than any team in baseball. So Exactly. But, exactly. Yeah, so they're, I, they're having no effect of last year. And plus, they definitely are getting better now that they have Acuna back. But um, I do think overall right now, the standings are pretty similar to what I would expect. I would say the Marlins and the Phillies 
would be competing a little bit more. I would, I, think, I would think the Braves would be a little higher than where they are at the moment. But the Mets have just been playing really good baseball. When you have, you know, you, even with the loss of DeGrom, where he may not even pitch this year now, with the loss of DeGrom and now having uh, the Phil, so now having uh, Mad Max to also be on that rotation, you still have a dominant ace because he's still pitching like nobody's business. He's still being Mad Max Scherzer. The Marlins are doing really good work, and I'm really impressed to see how far they've come, especially since they just kind of completely ruined my Mariners for a little bit. But they've got a really nice team, and it's really cool to see what they've done in the last couple of years, especially with the true emergence of uh, uh, Jess Chisholm. So I like yes. this, I like what I'm seeing from the Marlins, but I think that this year this is the Mets division. No, that's what I had. I had Mets, Braves, Phillies, Marlins, Nats as uh, the division. I think the Marlins are successful similarly to the way that the um, – not to the degree because these pitchers aren't all developed to that level yet, but to the degree of how Milwaukee's successful. Their staff has been electric. Alcantara, Lopez has been amazing. Uh, Hernandez's underground numbers are better than his surface. His surface numbers suck, so if he can get going a little bit better than yeah, Lizardo has been a pretty solid pick pickup for them from the uh, A's, obviously. So Trevor Rogers uh, is a guy that if he can get going, which I expect these two, the two guys in Hernandez and Rogers are two good young pitchers. So they have good young pitching. Uh, our guy, Ken's guy, Anthony Bass has pitched well early. Uh, Susser, <laughs> uh, Petit's been good. He's been good. Like they have the depth guys, like a guy like, like a guy like Lewis Heed that, has been in the minors a lot of his career. That's 32. That's pitched good in seven innings for them, too. So, like, if you can get that from the good starting staff that you have as a young staff, that's the big key word for me, though. I don't like picking young teams. That's why I picked them as fourth, because I feel like the Marlins are right on the cusp of being in the top three of the NLE somewhere for years to come. But this is, like, the year before that's going to fully happen because they have – uh, Chisholm this year, who's really ready. But I think the guys like um, somebody like Sanchez might take an extra year to be fully there. But Jesus Sanchez seems like he's going to be a pretty successful player. Plus other guys that they have in the prospect pool, one of the better in baseball. So I feel like they're a year or so away, but that's kind of the reason I had that. But for the AL East, uh, I'll go first on this one, and then we'll see what uh, you had. I had the... Jays, the rhyming teams. I had the Jays, Rays, uh, and then I had the Sox, Yankees, and Orioles. So obviously the Yankees are doing better than I thought. I also thought the Yankees would be way more injured because that's just the Yankee way lately. So I put the Yankees lower because their injury history has not been good to them lately. Yeah, for me right now, I had the Jays at number one, and I still think they are going to be the number one team. The Yankees have definitely over. Done on, especially on the last 10, they're 10 and 0. So good on them. Yeah, so that's not going to last year. Yeah, that's not going to last. But their home record is 10 and 3. That's impressive. I like seeing that. But for the Jays right now, I still think this is definitely their division. They have so many young stars. Their players are playing really good baseball. It's just about now putting it all together for one, you know, full on good season. And if they could do that, then fantastic. Although I will say, and I am going to fully toot my horn on this one, I think that the signing of Yusei Kikuchi was a problem for the for the Blue Jays. And they are starting to regret it now. As Yusei has not looked great for the team. No, so, but the rest of their pitching has been stellar, so I think oh, yeah, they can no, get perfect. around it. And, and, like, he'll be able to... Like, the thing with, like, this their team is... Like they now have, they have a lot of guys that I think he can just kind of mix in and find it with. Where obviously last year you didn't have Gilbert at this level yet, and other guys were not fully developed to the level. And Munoz, I think, was was not uh, in. So now you have him in for a full season because he got traded during the season. So you have like other. I think everything the Mariners, if they were where they're at this year, last year, I feel like Akuchi could have mixed in better but with the blue jays and the stamp they have he can kind of mix in his struggles and you're like well i hate this well, if you're a blue jays fan but here's the thing he, though that's if he pitches to like a four era we have other guys that are going to do it basically 
Because here's the thing that's kind of the problem with Kikuchi, and this is what I didn't understand, is that if he had stayed with Seattle, he had a player option on his contract. That would have been $14 million. Like, that's a lot more than I think you think Kikuchi deserves. And last year... Well, he also got overpaid, I think, from... I can't remember his contract, but I remember when I did the video thinking they paid him a pretty penny because Kikuchi, to me... From talking, he's just one of those guys that battles but doesn't always have the nasty. He's never been able to bring the stuff he showed in Japan fully to the MLB. So that's the issue with him. And he's just a guy that's been pitching to like high threes, low four ERAs, and that's fine. But you don't want to pay the pretty penny. But I think they expect him because I know in some rotation projections he was put in the fourth spot by the end of the season. And I think they expect him just to be a good guy that can battle and have some good eated innings for you around what I just said and don't even expect that much for him, but they just have money, so they're like, screw it. But we'll just yeah, but that's, fill that's, a horrible way to, a, that's a horrible way to run a baseball team then. If you're going to spend a lot of money on a player, you got to hope you're going to get some production out of him. And I Oh, just, no, no, no. They, they don't, don't expect it. this shit. They don't expect this shit, I don't think. I think they expect, like I said, like a 3-9 to like a 4-3. That's the problem. They're getting like a whatever the hell. I've watched some of the games he's pitched and watched a lot of the condensed games this year for games on MLB TV that I, when I haven't been able to watch full games because of hockey. And um, he's looked terrible this year. So I completely get yeah. what The buzz thing is that, like, with Kikuchi, as a, okay, I can say this as a Mariner fan, my word, you say Kikuchi has been aggravating. I love I when he's on, my gosh, he's awesome. But he is more streaky than a paintbrush. He's more streaky than Windex. Like, I look at this <laughs> yeah. guy and I don't understand how any team can watch it's I'm gonna quote Moneyball here for a second. When other teams see you as Yusei Kikuchi, they see a potential ace pitcher. When I see Yusei Kikuchi, I see a guy that's barely a fifth starter. Because when you see him throw, yes, he's got good velocity. Yes, he's got a pretty decent spin rates, but he gets lit up. Like, looking at his stats just this year alone, watch this. So, on the season so far right now, a 5.52 ERA, 0-1 record, over 14 and two-thirds innings pitched. So, not a huge sample size yet. Only 13 strikeouts. He has a strikeout-to-walk ratio of 1. Just an even one. And a strikeout per nine of eight, which, you know, not horrible, but not really great either. Like, it, it's 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 solid. You know, it, it's okay. Not amazing. And a whip of nearly two. Now, okay, you could say that's just one year, right? You could say that's just one year. Take a look at his numbers as a career. His strikeouts per walk was is 2.34. Not where you like to see it at. His strikeouts per nine is at that eight over his career. His homer per nine is still 1.6, which is serviceable. And serviceable for a nine, four or five, but the rest yeah, of the stats ser- are. Hmm. And a career whip of 1.422. And that's on a top of that, a, yeah, a FIP and a career FIP of just shy of five. Yeah, that so he has fist. No, I agree with you. You and I. I know, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to convince. I'm not trying to convince you on this. I'm just saying that when I'm looking at this, I don't understand how a team, how any teams, can really see that he has earned like a big level contract. Like I don't. I'm looking at this right now. Do you know how much money he's making just this season alone? He's making 16 million. Yeah. Yeah, like, so that's so there you go. That's why he left. He made more money. Made yeah. more money. Oh no, I understand why he left. I'm I got nuts. <laughs> when I saw that Yusei Kikuchi declined his player option, I'm pretty sure I screamed. I'm pretty sure at this point right now, my, I lost feeling in my face because I was smiling so much. Like I don't like to you know normally lose guys, but man, he was going to make guys 14 that million. You're not mad to see go, oh, yeah. That fourteen million dollars went to signing other people. That fourteen million went to getting Robbie Ray. That fourteen million went to getting the contracts of Eugenio yeah. Suarez and Jesse Winker, who all three of them are star, like are stud players on this team right now. But and before, I agree. But before you go, we also have to say we skipped over the AL Central. So we oh, do true, yeah. To- uh, we do have to say that one before you go, and you got to get going. So yeah, yeah. I figured um, 
This one was an interesting division because of all the moves the Detroit Tigers made, of course, to adjust the division that have sucked early. Uh, but, you know, it's early, so the keyword was early in that statement. Early, yeah. And the Twins have been a very impressive team, and the Guardians are not going to stay this good, but they have kind of been like the NL Central. is not the best overall division list this, this, this early, but I think the AL Central is going to be better than the NL in the end overall. It's just mm-hmm. they got to catch up. But I had the White Sox, Tigers, Twins, Royals, and then Guardians because I like the young talent of the Royals. That's why I put them above the Guardians. But the Guardians are playing above their skis right now. So they are. maybe that one. First. I think what I had, if I remember back to when I did my division predictions, because, yeah, this has been a very interesting division because of all the moves, and especially what the Twins were doing, that they were being the most confusing team in baseball because they were signing people but also letting people go and trading away pieces. for. And Sano also has to get surgery again. Mr. Mm -hmm. Great hitter, great power bopper guy went on the field, but unfortunately (laughs) can't stay on the field enough. Mr. Uh, BR uh, and will be the show legend, Miguel Sano. But um, no, I had it as I believe Tigers were actually my number one team. This uh, going into okay. it, it was, the, it was between the Tigers and the White Sox for me. Like they were going to definitely That's be competing for, me, yeah. for the top. And then having the Twins right after that, then it was going to be pretty close for the last place between the Guardians and the Royals, where I had the Guardians taking fourth place and the Royals taking fifth just because. It's not sustainable only having the offense of Alberto Modesty and Salvador Perez on your team. Like it was kind yeah. of, I actually went to a Mariner Royals game not not too long ago and I talked with a Royals fan while there and they I remember him griping because it's like how can you have Ryan O'Hearn as your starting first baseman when he can barely hit the ball and is a defensive liability? They do have Ben Attendee, though. Ben Attendee. Oh, Ben Attendee's fantastic. I like Ben Attendee. I think Ben Attendee's going to be a good ball player for that team. But they have so little to work with right now at the moment that it just it's hard to, to go from, you know? That kid, Eddie, all, um, Edward Oliveras is also not the Oh, kid. also. Got very true. Very yeah, true. And I think Bobby Witt. I think Bobby Witt's also going to be there. Yeah, Witt's going to be good. Witt got off to a good start and then cooled a bit and then has had a couple good games. So, But I yeah. think overall he'll be a good – and if you ask John Chiambi in the new MLB game, I don't have it, but I heard it on my friend TV the one time. He thinks he's one of the best shortstops in baseball already according to that game. So, um. Um, <laughs> so we have that. Um, but yeah. – but, no, we gave our division projections. This has been the Sports Fanatic News MLB cast where we talked about the Seattle Mariners, Phillies, and gave an overall analysis of the league this far and where we think teams will be in the end. As of right now, even with the Rangers, I know Alex left me, but I don't change my predictions this quickly because that's just a naive way to think it because then you're just flip-flopping if the team gets hot. So then you just look like more of an idiot. I mean, I can't, I can't so, be saying I'm flip-flopping when yeah. I put the Tigers to win and still stick with the Tigers winning even though they're Oh, no, 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 no. I, oh, I know, I know, I know. My, I'm playing with you. I'm playing like with like you I did that. with my friend's NHL show. Like I said, <laughs> I'm not – like I picked the Minnesota Wild to win, but the Blues railed them in the first game it's on the scoreboard, but I still think there's different things Minnesota did well. I'm not changing my prediction of course. after that's, that. So, like – that that's all. Like I have to see it. Like Memorial Day is kind of when I probably change stuff. When I kind of look at the grand scheme, because that's when historically, if a team's a few games, like a certain amount of games out, other than like a few times in history, they haven't come back. So that's kind of when I start adjusting things. Definitely. All right. Well, thanks but for having me on the show. Man. I appreciate you. you. Yeah, no, did you um, have anywhere you want to share? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll do a quick shout out to. Um, Make sure you, uh, we have a podcast as well through OTH. It's called Cheap Seats Chatter. You can hear me and Mac and Splash on that where we talk about all different things within the realm of baseball. We sometimes even do fun things like games. Our last episode, we did a, uh, th- a game of higher or lower with fun historic and modern stats. But we also talk about you know predictions. We talk about the most current news in baseball. It's a fun time if you want to come get some good information, but also see there's a bunch of dudes having a good time. Go and check us out. We're on Spotify and other major podcasting platforms. Awesome, awesome. And you can follow me at JJBorg26. Please continue to subscribe here to help us grow to our goal of 250 by the start of June. Have a safe day, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the MLB season.